Ask me how many black professors of electrical engineering do I know? How many? I don't. Not a single. Sure, black South African professor of electrical engineering. I don't know any. How are you going to run ESCOM successfully? I had to fly to Cape Town for this one. I've been wanting it to happen for quite some time. I came here and we had a great afternoon because Dr. Loazilu Shaba hosted me. We had a, a great sit down and it was a, an honor for me to meet you and just to experience your humility. And um, how you had said to me, I'd like to get to know you first. I think it was, I don't know if it was early this year or last year. Late last year, I think, or early this year, I can't quite remember. Yes, but um, and then I also, I think, reached out a few months ago. Yes, I was off to KZN. Yeah, um, I'm glad finally this is happening. <laughs> well, all good things uh, come to those who wait. Uh, I suppose uh, maybe it was worth, you know, waiting. Maybe this is the right moment. All those other times we tried, maybe it wasn't quite as yet the moment. You know, people who live in this world, things that the things we do in the world, uh, we determine them on the basis of what happens, you know, in this material world. Maybe, you know, there's another world that hadn't actually agreed and has now finally come around. And so... Let's make the most of it. Thank you, Nyebonga Akulu. For those who don't know, he has a BA Honours from the University of Transke, an MA in Philosophy from the University of Ibadan, and um, uh, is it MPhil? It's an MPhil, yes. MPhil from the Center for Studies in Social Sciences in Kolkata, and a PhD from the University of Vedvatesrand with what is Rand Vetsi. He's a Vetsi. <laughs> he has taught at Fort Hare and Vets, and he has held a visiting fellowship at the African Studies Center, Leiden, in Netherlands. And he was also uh, a visiting scholar at Harvard University, United States. Ladies and gentlemen, I I'm honored to finally present to you Dr. Loazi Lushava. He's finally here. No, no, Bonga Tina, Bonga Tina. We thank you for the good work you're doing. Uh, but we also uh, thank the black people who have uh, embraced the work that we are doing. Uh, and hopefully, this session is also going to add some value, you know, to, to the good work that we are doing. Bonga uh, Tina. No, Siabonga. And this is also on behalf of all the other people who always request you to do interviews. Is there a reason why you don't do interviews? Um, I don't know what kind of interviews you are referring to, but I do have an aversion to, you know, um, to, to the figure that is now very dominant in South African media, which is the figure of uh, the political analyst. Um, so mostly you see those people on TV, you know, um, I, I do have an aversion to that kind of a figure that, you know, is very now dominant, you know, in mainstream media, especially for two reasons. One is somehow you get a sense that um, there is no distinction as to who becomes an authority in the field. So I suspect that if you present yourself, you know, to the public and claim to be a political analyst, it is because you've become an authority in the field. And oftentimes the people we get presented with, you do not get a sense that they have actually earned the right to be considered authorities in the field. Um, the second thing is that there is also an implicit, uh, it's not very explicit, but there is an implicit, you know, tendency of an allure, so to say, the allure towards being a celebrity. You know, when people, you know, present themselves as, you know, political analysts on TV, uh, you get a sense that it, it is uh, a step, you know, or there is an attraction, what I call the allure, you know, of a celebrity figure. Uh, so it's not quite the value of the knowledge they bring. It's most often times you get a sense it is, you know, the opportunity to be seen and the opportunity, you know, to increase your publicity. I, for that reason, do not, you know. And um, I, the other kinds of interviews, I mean, um, I, prefer, I prefer more meaningful engagements, you know, that are not posturing, 
you know, uh, because often also, you know, you get people who um, appear on TV and it's for five, ten minutes. So someone says, I'm going to explain to you what is the current problem in South Africa. And so, and then you say in five, ten minutes, you're going to tell us what are the problems of a country that has been colonized for centuries. You know, uh, you know, as well as everyone else knows that, you know, um, it's such a complex, you know, topic that you can't in five, ten minutes. But it's all about publicity. You know, it's all about the allure of, of a celebrity. So I, the kind of work I do, which is to educate and to converse with black people, um, can be done away from, from, from there. And um, I, I appreciate you for your honesty and appreciate you for the willingness to, to always teach the art of teaching and sharing knowledge. Our platform is an educational platform. In, in, initially, when I started it, I'd speak to strictly entrepreneurs. Okay. But as times went by, I kind of felt everybody is an entrepreneur in their own right. Whether it's musicians, whether it's TV people, whether it's, uh, it's politics. And um, seeing that we're an educational platform, we are educating. We are getting stories from these different people. And it gives us an opportunity to indulge in, in different stories and different topics. And it's been, uh, it's been an incredible journey. The platform has grown amazingly. Ever since I started this platform, Abandu Bekela. And I do, I, in the beginning, I didn't know. And this was 2019. Yeah. And then I started researching. I've seen some of your videos. I watched and listened to an, let me say I listened to a SAFM podcast interview that you had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that one also trended at some point. And um, it, it interested me. And that's when I started getting more and more interested in, to, in, in you and wanting to find out more about you. And I'm just glad that that rabbit hole has brought me to eventually sit down with you, which is a few years later. So I want to thank all the hustlers that have been asking for him. Well, um, it is you that I, I, I would thank. It is you that I would thank. And, um, you know, the, 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 the responsibility of... of, of talking about our condition as black people, uh, which maybe still takes me back to your initial question about the aversion to have interviews. You see, the, the experience of black people is not something to be traded as a commodity uh, on which people gain popularity, you know, or gain a celebrity status. It's our lived experience. It's a painful condition, you know, of black people. And I think that you know, um, it, it's not, like I said, something to be used, you know, as a currency, you know, that people, um, you know, would, would use, as I said, you know, to buy, to buy or to trade, you know, for their celebrity. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm a teacher by profession. Um, and I think that my responsibility to society is where I have knowledge. It's not on everything that I have knowledge, but it is where I have knowledge to, to enlighten particularly black people uh, as a result, you know, uh, of our condition. Um, so I, I am very glad that you persisted until you got us, you know, to do this today. We are recording this on the 1st of September. I can see the campus here in UCT is, is a bit empty. You are telling me what Bafala Namsanji by car. So um, this is what is called midterm break. Okay. Um, halfway through the semester, uh, the second semester, just like it is in the first semester, students do get a break, and I would suspect that yeah, that's uh, the reason why campus is a little quiet. Uh, it is because today was the last day, you know, of of, of uh, lectures. Yeah. So students yeah would be away maybe for just about a week. Okay. And then they are back again, you know, for the last leg of, of, of the year. So uh, your, your lectures are not just normal lectures. Your lectures also get attended by people who are not necessarily students. You know, there was a time and it's unfortunate that we lost that as a result of the gentrification of universities. Um, I do recall very well at a time when I went to the university at the University of Transkei. I, I recall very well when I had reasons to go to vet university before I became a student there. Those campuses were open. If you were interested, if, if, if you were interested as a member of the public, you could walk in you know, and attend a lecture of your choice, which would have meant at the time that indeed universities were public. 
And somehow, you know, all the universities have become so fancy. In fact, they look like garrisons now, you know. Before you are able to get into vets, you probably would have to produce your dompas, you know, um, you know, in addition to your ID. And if you don't have it, you know, you might not be able to get it. Or you must have 10 reasons to be on campus. Now, we lost, we lost that relationship as a result of universities closing in. We lost that opportunity of universities being open spaces where people can go and learn. They became indeed, you know, the ivory towers, you know, secluded from the people. Now, what I try and do, you know, at UCT, at least within the confines of a university that thankfully is unable to close itself in because of the way in which UCT is structured, it's unable to close itself in. And so there is still that possibility of someone walking in from outside and going straight to the lecture hall if they know where the lecture is holding. And um, because of the interest, and I, I do not invite people, um, you know, I, all I do is to keep the lecture open, but I do not go inviting people that you must come to the lecture. I have noticed over the years that we attract to, you know, introduction to political science at UCT. Not only students who are registered for the course, but we are able also to attract students in other faculties. In fact, people come as far as, you know, uh, medicine and health sciences generally to attend. And we do from time to time get, you know, workers also who attend the lectures and then we get people from outside campus. That tells me that at least the university still has and is still in that little way still able to fulfill its public duty, you know, um, not to only paying students because, you know, the ascendancy of a liberal university has transformed the student, in fact, into a client or, you know, into someone, you know, to whom a service is rendered. And so we no longer have a relationship with students in the university as people who have come to access what is a social good that, you know, which is a collective responsibility, which I try to emphasize, you know, my first year students, wherever you meet them, will tell you that this is where we begin. Now, at UCT, and it is the case in many other universities, when fees have been paid, when students, all the students at UCT pay their fees, those amount to only 25% of our running costs. Mm. Only 25%. When everyone has paid, yeah. the rest we get from government. Which then says that as a student, you don't pay for this service. Basically, you can't, as you would do in a restaurant or a pick and pay, say that I'm a client, I've come, you know, I must be treated as someone who's paid for a service. This is a common good. This is a social good. I pay taxes. Part of that 75% comes from my taxes, you know, as a lecturer, which means that I have to relate with the student, not as a client, but I have to relate to a student as someone who's benefiting from a public good or a social good, which means then that if you treat that social good as a student in an irresponsible manner, if you do not show the seriousness that is expected of a student, I have every reason, not just as a teacher, I have every reason to say to you, this is public taxpayer's money. So if you do not treat it with the respect that it deserves, it is someone who is sitting in Tsofimba, who is sitting in Gangelizwe, who is sitting in Guama, Shemlas, who was not able to come here. But when they go to buy bread, when they pay that 15% vet, they are subsidizing your education. So that's how we have to treat education as a collective and as a social good. So I'm happy when people come from all over, you know, to attend the lectures because it means that even if we have failed in treating university education as a social good, these kinds of visits to the lectures are a reminder that education is a public good. There are people who solely because they don't have money, have been denied this opportunity, but they also have, are equally eager to learn. Some of the people who attend the lectures, they travel from, you know, Kailicha, from Gwalanga, and, you know, from the location. So they spend their last cent, you know, to be able to access education. Now, it tells you that they've taken responsibility for their enlightenment. 
Now we must demand exactly that same attitude from the students also, you know. Um, but so that we do not lose the point, the point is that we have people who come to attend these lectures from different, you know, walks of life. And that reminds us that education should not be reserved for those who can afford. Education is a public good. When you have an enlightened citizenry, the whole society is for the good. The rise of liberalism has taught us something wrong, which is that education is good just for me so that I'm able to go and work. No. It is good for society. When we are educated as an individual, it's not good for you. It's good for society as a whole. And so um, those, those little you know, gestures with people coming to those lectures, they do you know, remind us, as I've said, that education is a public good and we must treat it so. But they also maybe tell us of a future that once was, which was when universities were open where people could walk in. So imagine if you didn't have money to be at UCT, but you lived in Guala, all that you would need is your fare to be able to come to campus, you know, once or twice a week. In three years, you would be an enlightened citizen. Mm. But now, even if you wish to, because of the nature of the universities, you are not able to. So suppose you decided, you lived close to a university in Bramfontein, in Mtata, you know, or anywhere. You decided that once or twice a week, I'm going to attend my politics classes because I want to know about the politics, or I'm going to attend philosophy classes, or I'm going to attend, you know, introduction to medicine. You would end up with a citizenry that is enlightened. Previously, in the future that once was, rather, in the future that once was, this was called, you know, auditing. You know, people audited, you know, courses in the universities. Um, and so I think that uh, when we talk about opening up education, uh, I think our idea of opening up education has also been limited into we open up education just in terms of finances or in terms of, you know, lessening, you know, the, the bar in terms of how much people are expected to pay. I think a real a real opening up of the university would be to make education, especially university education, less elitist, you know, so that it's not a select, you know, 10% of the country that has access to it. Um, I'm sure if we got to that point, there would be many people who would find satisfaction. I would be one of the many people who would find satisfaction, for instance, if University of Cape Town said, what if we took some of our lectures to Kailich, Gualang? You know, uh, it's known that there is this kind of education that is designed for the public by the University of Cape Town, where people don't pay. You know, we, we are there every weekend or we are there, you know, once a week to educate the public. Would that not be a contribution of the university to the public? I think that it would be it would be a contribution to enlightening the public because as I've said, an educated public is good for society. Mm -hmm. It's not education is not a commodity. Unfortunately at present, the predominant kind of thinking tells us that I must go to UCT so that I get a certificate and then that becomes a commodity with which I go to buy other commodities. You know, basically becomes your currency with which to go buy a car to go buy other things to consume as an individual. We lose the sense of education being, you know, a public good. But is um, education in 2023 relevant, South African education? So there, 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 are, there, are, there could be many ways of thinking about whether it is relevant uh, or, or not. One of the ways of thinking about that question would be to say, indeed, it is relevant to a system this education at present, and more specifically, formal schooling, you know, primary, secondary, up to university, as it exists today, the education system in South Africa and, you know, in the world generally, as it exists, was designed specifically as a site of reproduction of a kind of people who are useful for the continued reproduction of a capitalist social order. So what does that mean? It simply means that what do people learn when they come to the university? They do not only learn mathematics, chemistry. They learn a whole way of being in the world, of relating to themselves, 
of relating to other people and of relating to the world. And in all those relationships, they are mediated by one thing, by the ability to buy or to consume commodities. So I relate to you when I've come to UCT, I relate to you first on the basis of your status. You know, uh, without you telling me, I, I have to first determine, you know, in my head, what is your status, which is to say, what kind of commodities are you able to buy or afford and to consume? And so I relate also to myself. That's what you learn in the university. You relate to the body basically as something that you can pimp. You know, I, it's more or less like a car that you take into some shop and then you say, pimp this car up. Because in the university, you also learn that the body is basically something that is available. But we also learn how to relate to the world. So in the university, you learn that the world is basically available for you, you know. Uh, and so you have primacy over the world. The world exists to satisfy, you know, your needs. You do not think about the world as actually having the same right as you. You know, so because the world, we think of the world as the world of things. Things are available to us as human beings. We can use them. Only recently we're beginning to learn, you know, that actually our own being as human beings is also dependent on the well-being of the universe, which is the environment, as they say. We had always known as black people, as Africans, because no African went into the forest and took all the trees down. You took what you needed and left what you did not need because you would go back the other day, whatever else you needed, you would find them. But then came the modern way of thinking that said, you must amass all the things unto yourself so that you then can then commoditize them and sell them, you know, as, as commodities to make profit. So, the university education that we have, unfortunately, is meant to produce this modern subject that relates to the self, that relates to others, and that relates to the world. And all those relationships are mediated basically by man. That's the unfortunate thing that people learn in the university. Now, if you then ask the question, if we restate the question you've posed, is this education relevant? Of course, in a world of capitalist consumption, this education is very relevant because when people finish at UCT, they can't wait. All they can't wait to do is to earn that salary so that they can consume commodities. No one says, I can't wait to go and be useful to society. That's not what the university teaches. You must, your education is useful to you, you know, in terms of enabling you to consume, you know, other commodities. That is where that figure of the political analyst that I spoke of, that's the ethic also. They do not appear on TV because they really have thought long and hard about the things they talk about. It is an opportunity to increase, you know, your public traction so that you become this brand that is going to fetch you, you know, money so that you consume other commodities. So the point is that this education indeed is useful to the prevailing capitalist order, modern capitalist order. The question has to be, for us, the black colonized, what is our relationship with modernity or modern capitalism? Is modern capitalism to our benefit as black people? Now, the answer is a long one, but we can shorten it and say, if you think historically, the coming of capitalism or capitalist modernity to the continent is midwife by colonialism. So what comes to the continent is not pure capitalism. It is or it's not modernity, it is colonial modernity. It is basically modernity that is mediated by colonial relations. In a moment, I'll explain what are those colonial relations. So the, the coming of modernity or modern capitalism into the continent is mediated by our domination, which means that as Africans, we get integrated into this prevailing modern capitalist order as subordinates. We, we get integrated from ab initio, 
We get integrated into modern capitalism as dominated people because the West is basically the owner of the model. So this model is not ours. You know, uh, we, 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 we basically not even borrow the model. The model is forced on us, you know, by, by, by the West. And so we come into it basically, you know, as disadvantaged people. The second point about, and trying to answer the question whether modernity, capitalist modernity is good for us as African people, it is that there is a certain supposition that the knowledges that exist in the modern times are objective and scientific. So people say, no, no, no. Um, you know, what we learn in the university is objective and scientific. You know, that's how the world is. And so that's, you know, not available, you know, for ideologization and whatnot. Now, if you trace the history of all modern knowledges, of all the disciplines that are, we teach here in the University of Cape Town, they all have a particular origin. So they have a birth date and they have a birthplace. They are all, all the disciplines, from medicine to the social sciences, they all begin at a point when Europe transitions from what is called the medieval period into the modern period. This is the period when Europe become a modern industrial capitalist society. So all of the disciplines we teach in the university all make sense within a modern industrial capitalist order. There is not a single of the disciplines that make sense outside of that. When you go to a doctor, we don't train doctors today to heal people. We train doctors so that they make money. You can live with a doctor next door who sees you and watches you every day that Sbu is destroying his life with his diet. But until Sbu comes to my you know, consulting room and pays, I'm not going to tell him. That's the nature of Western thought. You live next door to a dietitian who sees you every day eating McDonald's and you know, eating artificial or processed food and sees you getting bloated but doesn't tell you anything, doesn't say, look, if you eat this way, this is what happens to the body. Uh, if you drink this much of alcohol, this is what happens to the body. No, they wait until you come to their rooms. And then that's the only time. Because this is the structure of Western knowledge. Its purpose is not to serve society. Its purpose is to save this, the modern industrial capitalist order, which is let's accumulate and you know, um, and consume commodities. Mm. So, um, so what, what, what the nature of Western education um, is, it's not value free. The point I'm, uh, the third point I need to make about, you know, in answering your question, whether, you know, Western, this education is relevant for us, um, is that Western education as we have it today is not value free, which is to say, that when it emerges in Europe, you know, uh, when Europe is transitioning in the 16th century from the medieval period to the modern period, there is change not just in the nature of how, you know, production happens. There is also change in societal values. And one of, you know, the most dominant change at the time is that there is an individualization of society which is to say the individual suddenly from that moment becomes the center of society. So society came to think of itself as a collection of individuals. So the individual took primacy over, you know, the collective. Now, today we assume that it's logical that people, when they think and when they articulate their views, we take it for granted that they have to begin from the individual self. Now, the individual self, you know, becomes the basis of society, the unit of analysis in society, as a result of a cultural transformation in Europe at the time of the transition from the medieval period to the modern period. That is not how all societies are organized. Now, what happens is that because our education system emerges as it is. It emerges out of that particular period. Today, we sit in the university and tell people that, you know, the individual is the basis of society. And then you end up, you know, with a clash 
between Western values and African values, mm. you know. And so you have a Western education that suddenly shows its cultural basis mm. at that point. Because this individualization of society was not just the individualization of society. It came with several other things. One, that the individual takes precedent over the collective, you know, over society. But also, and most importantly, it was that societal values or collective values that are important for the continued reproduction of society, they crumble. Because now, over those values that are responsible for the reproduction of society, individual values have to prevail. You can see, you know, how this is, even in Western ordered societies, you can see how it's actually out of joint. Liberals or people who believe that the individual has choice and everything tell us that it is my right as an individual to smoke. When you have cancer, you become a collective bedding. Because now the public health system has to take care of you. When you were smoking, you told us that, you know, individuals have a right, you know, and their right, you know, take precedent over everyone else. You know, um, so I'm trying to say, even within a Western ordered society, the idea of the individual taking precedent over the collective or, you know, a collective good is actually very faulty. But my more important or the most important point I'm driving at is that Western education emerges out of a particular cultural context. And that cultural context is Europe that is individualizing, that is beginning to consider the individual basically as the source of everything, source of knowledge, source of authority. You know, the individual is self-determining, has the right to give unto himself or herself the laws, you know, on the basis of which he or she is going to live. Now, when that Western education comes to the continent, it finds a people who had a cosmology. Because there is a certain supposition that it's as if, you know, there was tabula rasa here. You know, uh, this Western education came when there was nothing. It actually came at a time, or it came to a place where there was a whole fully developed cosmology. Fully developed cosmology that made sense of everything, including the stars, including the galaxy and everything. But it denied that cosmology or that order of knowledge. It denied validity to that and substituted itself as the all. Again, to go back to the question, is this knowledge relevant? To accept Western knowledge as is, is to accept our colonial domination because that displacement of our knowledge was not basically on the basis of the superiority of Western knowledge. It was on the basis of the gun. Colonialism was an expression of power, you know, of the West over us. And that power enabled them to discard or to push aside, to delegitimize our own kinds of knowledge. Now, to accept Western knowledge is invariably to accept our domination. Because as I've shown, you know, Western education can, comes loaded with Western cultural values. Now, I suspect that those of us who have been agitating for a decolonized, you know, education have precisely been moving from that premise. That premise that, you know, this Western education has certain cultural bases assumptions and foundations that are antithetical to our own ways of being in the world as black people. We do not, this is, this is the tragedy of Western education. Whereas other kinds of knowledges do not quarrel with the existence of Western education. Western education is authoritarian. It says it has to be me only. So once it comes in, no other kind of knowledge can exist. Any other kind of knowledge that wants to exist must come on its knees before Western education and justify itself. Show us, you know, whether it's reasonable, it's rational, you know, and objective and scientific. Now, we do not, the world does not aspire to be like the West. 
it is not the whole world that suddenly woke up and said we aspire to be like the west and therefore you know we'll come justify our forms of religion our cultural values our moods of being in the world you know before reason and rationality of the west no that was as a result of colonial violence and domination so the argument is that anyone who tells us that this education, as we have it today, is good for us, it is people who've accepted our colonial domination because this education came as part of our domination. But this domination, we must not think of it as people often do, as only being economic. No, this domination is also cultural. This domination is also the negation of our own religions. You know, this negation of our own forms of being in the world. And I must say just one more thing there and then um, hopefully the point would have been made. It is that when you depend on Western education to explain lives of black people, this is what you do. You come to the University of Cape Town, they teach you sociology, they teach you anthropology, they teach you political science, they teach you religious studies. So when you graduate as a sociologist, they tell you that this is how you explain things sociologically. You go out in the world and this is what you then do. You see people and then you see them with a sociological eye. Now, as black people, our lives are not lived in accordance with disciplinary boundaries. As I'm sitting here, which part of me are you going to say is here? Is it the sociological part? Is it the political science part? Is it, uh, is it the anthropological part? No. As I sit here, I sit with my ancestors. So all at once, present here, it's my material self. Present here is my ancestral self. Present here is my metaphysical self. Speaking now, it's my physical self, but it's also my ancestral self. It's my metaphysical self. So how are you going to explain that? You know, because what universities, Western universities do, you first develop categories and then you impose them on our lives as if our lives are lived in accordance with these disciplinary boundaries. When you see people go to work, black people go to work in the morning, as they go to work, they are praying to their ancestors, may they come back from work safe. You know, as they go to work, they, they hope and pray from their ancestors that the day is productive, you know. So are you seeing a worker as you see that person walking to work? Or are you seeing a religious person who is praying at that time? Or are you seeing someone whose everyday life is overflowing with the ancestral and the metaphysical? Now, Western education cannot explain our lives as African people. Because in our music, for instance, they say, you know, um, this is music. We do not sing because it's music. As we sing, you know, we, we, we pray. As we sing, music is several things. It does several things, you know, just as it is that our own music, unlike Western music, often does not have a proprietor. We have songs that no one has ever claimed as their own. Now, you have Western education that says, but you know, who wrote the song? You know, many of the songs that belong to black people were collectively generated out of the experience of a number of people. So no one person could suddenly claim it you know, and say that it was your own because it came out of the experience of, you know, people. The point I'm making is that Western education is not, you know, a value neutral um, thing. Western education is actually a culturally laden and a value laden body of knowledge. And so it is not right to assume that this is scientific objective knowledge. When it comes to the continent, we we'll remember, it comes in the service of colonialism, of Western domination. So the university itself, you know, um, comes to Africa as part of what is called epistemological domination or the domination of the mind. Mm -hmm. Because colonialism, if it was only military might, it wouldn't have survived. If it depended solely on the military strength, 
the number of soldiers with guns who would coerce people to obey the colonial order, it wouldn't have survived. Remember, in many of the colonies, you had only a few colonial administrators. How then did you, for instance, you know, in a country as large as Nigeria, with millions of people, you didn't have more than 100,000 colonial administrators. How then, you know, did you manage to domesticate, you know, this large number of people? Education was key to that project. So Western education comes as an integral part of the will to dominate by the West. How do you dominate? You give people new values. So if I've come with this Western education and I tell you that this is your way to the El Dorado, this is the way to success, for a moment you forget that we are being dominated. You say, so this is how I'm going to succeed. And once you accept the values, you actually take someone who's come to dominate you, you take that person for your savior. That's what Western education is to us. So as the continent, as the black colonized, we still have a long way to get to a point where we have an education system that is truly liberatory. And I can give you one example of what that education might look like. Think of it. What Western modernist education has said, it is that food is something that must be available to those who can afford it. So basically you have an order of knowledge that says, because someone doesn't have money, you must deny them a source of sustenance. Mm. Because we decided, Western education decided, remember I said, everything, your relationship to the self, to others and to the world is mediated by man. Because of that logic, we got to a point where we think it is right to deny someone, a human being, to deny a human being a source of sustenance because they don't have money. So you are basically saying that you are not fit to live if you don't have money. Now, how do we say we are an enlightened people, we're an educated people, when we say, because you don't have money, we are not going to have clean water? A source of sustenance. We know that a person's life is dependent, at least a physical sustenance of a human being is dependent on food and water. But the logic of Western thought says these are commodities, you must sell them to people. And so you basically have taken, you know, what people depend on in order to physically survive. They need other things to survive. They do not exist only as physical or material human beings. But you've taken their ability to wake up tomorrow, you know, and breathe because they don't have money. Now, this is why, this is why we have to be very critical of projects today that claim to you know, be projects that will lead to, for instance, African cooperation, that would lead to, you know, uh, a different world where Africa, you know, is united and it's a common market. What I haven't had in those aspirations, for instance, for a United States of Africa. So I hear people who are saying, we want to do exactly what the West is able to do. I don't hear people say, we do not think that it is ethical that people should go hungry. Or I do not hear people say this model that says food is a commodity to profit on is not a model that we want to replicate. What I hear is people who say we want to trade food even more. You know, it's only that now as individual countries, we aren't able to trade and maximize profit on food. There was a time when it was acceptable in world capitalist order to include slaves as part of your assets. So when you did your register of assets, you included you know, the number of slaves you had. That's how wealthy you were. So in today's you know, language, a company could basically value itself, you know, how much it is worth, included in that calculation would be the number of slaves. Until Western modernity took a decision that it was unethical to make human beings commodities, you know, on which you can trade. They took an ethical, they took a decision to render human beings as not to, or rather they, as they called it, 
there was a notion of what they call human difference. So once they came into a realization of this idea of human difference, they removed slaves from you know, the ledgers of the companies at the time. If we removed food, nothing will happen. If food became ceased to be something to profit on, just as slaves or human beings ceased to be things to profit on, the world will not collapse. My point is that I think that we have to think long and hard about an alternative order of the world. The modernist order of the world is not going to lead us to any human actualization. Because freedom, thought about appropriately, is more than just you know, the limited freedoms. It's human actualization. And I think that a freedom that has no ethics at its foundation can't be freedom. I think it's unethical that I walk you know, every day past people who can't afford to eat and I'm going to pick and pay because I earn a salary and can afford to buy food. And there are people who, are, who have as equal a claim to be in this world as I do. But I seem to have more claim to be in this world just because I have a salary or just because I have this thing called money that, you know, is able to buy commodities. I think that what we should design is an education whose basis is not the Cartesian assumptions about a modern subject whose primary, whose primary definition is its ability to earn money and consume other commodities. So basically what capitalism became and its education system became, it became that system where you are licensed to earn this commodity, which is money, and this commodity enables you to consume other commodities. That's basically what our lives have been reduced to, you know, as a result of Western modernity and its education system. I think that as African people, we have to design a different, you know, education system at whose foundation is not the modern subject. And I may perhaps have to say something a little about this modern subject. So we sit here today in Cape Town and we think that there is this universal figure that is a modern human being. You know, people would say, oh no, you know, you must be reasonable, you must be rational. And so when we talk about this modern person, we think that there's the same modern person in Nigeria, in India, and in everywhere. So we think of this modern subject as if, you know, it's a universal thing. It's not a universal thing. What is universal is the Western way of being in the world. And once that is universalized, we think that then it is primary or it is primordial. Uh, it is that we all come into the world to be modern. No. We come into the world to be different things. But there is this order called the Western modern order that universalizes itself, that says this is the right way of being in the world. And because it has universalized itself, we then think that this is the universal way of being in the world. So people think that reason, for instance, you must be reasonable, you must be rational. They think that, you know, that's a universal or a natural thing. Reason and rationality are wide. They come out of the Western transition into the modern order. Why do I say they are wide? So rationality is basically nothing but an extension to everyday life of the economic logic of cost-benefit analysis. So when someone says be rational, the person is basically saying to you, you needed to calculate. What would I benefit by going to Cape Town to talk to Dr. Rishan? You couldn't say to anyone, oh no, I mean, it's to fellowship with other black people. It, it's, they would say, but please be rational. I mean, that's not a rational, that's not a reasonable, you know, good reason for you. Because people assume, as a result of this universalization of the modern way of being in the world, this modern subject is someone who lives his or her life governed by these you know, two principles, reason and rationality. We think that's a natural way of being in the world. It's a universal way of, the world, of being in the world. No. Being human and being in the world, there are many ways of being in the world. Reason and rationality became universalized partly through Western education, but also it became universalized. It traveled the world on the back of capital, on the back of money. 
you know, uh, wherever money goes, it imposes reason and rationality, you know. So this is not a natural way of being in the world. So we can't accept Western education because its foundations, its foundations are what, you know, uh, puts us to the margin because there is this very imperious way of being in the world, this modern way of being in the world that we think is natural. It's, you know, we think reason is something that, you know, is in the air, that permeates the air that we all have to agree to. No, we don't, we don't have to agree to it. It was imposed on us by a people who had decided for themselves, Europeans, without inviting us into ill at the table, who decided for themselves that this is going to be their way of being in the world. And that way of being in the world is being a modern subject. And that modern subject lives governed by reason and rationality. Unfortunately, that's what we teach in the university. So I don't think that that education is what is going to lead us, you know, uh, into true human actualization as African people, as the black colonized, because as I've shown, you cease to be a human being. You know, in fact, you know, everyone who studied Western education, you no longer see human beings. You see, if you are a doctor, you see a patient. If you are a teacher, you see a student. If you are, so you get integrated into this order, you are given a category with which to exist. You are a taxpayer. You are this, you know, you can't exist as a human being, you know, because these categories have their own rules. This is how a student behaves. This is how a patient behaves. A patient waits and goes to present himself or herself at the surgery. Can't just stop a doctor and say, doctor, please explain to me what happens to me when I feel this pain. You can't stop a teacher and say, please explain to me why this happens. You must wait until you come to the university and pay it fees. So these categories with which we exist in the world, they impose on us a certain logic. That's why I'm saying the kind of education that will liberate us is the one that will enable us again to present ourselves in the world as human beings, not as patients, not as students, not as taxpayers, not as, you know, people with profession, as pastors, as this, because that also imposes a certain way of relating to other people. My younger brother is a UCT alumni. His name is Rorisang Museri. He is um, now working with the government. At some point, I think he was SRC president. Yeah. A lot of the engagements that we used to have a couple of years ago, he would be frustrated about UCT and the um, and, and what was going on in the institution at that time. Has UCT over the years transformed? How is UCT right now in 2023? Now, that's a very interesting question because just about um, less than a week ago, we, we had a meeting as black people at UCT. And, you know, the, the, the subject that brought us together was, you know, the problems of transformation at UCT. I, I, I had the privilege of being asked by other black people to present, you know, basically an analysis, you know, of where are we at UCT now? What is happening at UCT? And so what I'm going to share with you here are the thoughts I shared with other black people, you know, um, a few days ago when we gathered at UCT. I want to call, I want to explain this, you know, using a concept called the conjuncture. You know, um, so the, the, if we formulate this into a question, we would say, what is the current conjecture at UCT? Now, what do we mean by this concept of a conjecture? You know, if you put these discrete things here on the table in a certain order, they create certain possibilities. If you scatter them in this way, you know, they are just present. But if we pull them closer to me, they make a certain order. You can think of them, or oh, maybe these are notes, these are his notes that he's going to refer to. So once I open them this way, they create a certain objective condition. Whereas when they are scattered, you know, they, they, they might as well be a nuisance on the table. So the conjecture is the coming together of things that individually appear unrelated, but when you put them together, they create an objective condition. So, 
in a more disciplined way, um, basically the conjecture is an accumulation and exacerbation or worsening of contradictions mm. that leads to an objective condition or a historical situation, which is in simple terms, never mind the sophisticated language, which in simple terms is to say that if I planted needles, for instance, you know, the sewing needles, I planted them on the ground, but there was space in between them. If I ask you to step on them, they might hurt you. But if I plant them very close to each other, I've created a different objective condition. Because then if you step carefully on them, you might actually be able to walk on them if they are planted together, close, you know, closely together. That's what is basically what we mean with the notion of a conjecture. It's an accumulation and an exacerbation of contradictions leading to an objective situation or an objective situation or a historical you know, situation or condition. So I want us to use that concept uh, in order to think about what is happening at UCT because what is happening at UCT currently is very related to what is happening in the country generally. So at UCT in 2023, as I said, what is happening is very related to what is happening in the country. The conjecture is the same at UCT as in South Africa in 2023. And what is that conjecture? What are these contradictions that are accumulating and getting worsened? It is that the coming of that modernity we've been talking about, Europe's transition into the modern period, brought us what is you know, called the, the figure of a white person. This figure of a white person, which is the modern subject, the white person since 16th century has always known himself or herself as being responsible for the black person. The white person, Western thought generally has never anticipated a situation where the black person would be responsible for the white person. It is always the other way around where the white person, the white subject always relate with the black person as basically this thing, the object, the black object, and the white person has always known himself or herself since the 16th century, has always known himself to be the source from which authority radiates, the source from which light of knowledge and reason radiates towards the black person. It's never the other way around. Try experiment if you have uh, an opportunity. Buy some, buy a white person a gift. When at the point when you deliver it, they would say to you, "This must have cost you a lot of money. You didn't have to buy it." Because in the white psyche, it is always one way. The black person is always the recipient of a white of white magnanimity and white generosity. There is never a moment when there is black generosity that goes to a white person. So the white person has always known himself or herself to be a source of authority. So colonialism, remember, was justified as a project where the light of reason came from Europe in order to enlighten us, you know, black people who were in the dark continent. Now, this is what happens in South Africa in 1994 and at UCT in 2015, 2016, as a result of FISMAS 4. This white subject that had known itself to be the source of authority, to be responsible for identifying and correcting the deformities of the black person, suddenly, as a result of 1994, of independence in South Africa, suddenly, this white subject is displaced and the black person is now responsible for the white person. And so authority now no longer flows from the white subject to the black you know, object. Suddenly, the black person is responsible for the white subject. Suddenly, the white subject has to receive instruction and authority from the black person. But for centuries, Western thought had always said it is the white subject that is always responsible for the black person. In fact, if you read the literature, you would find white writings in South Africa, you know, particularly, um, you know, in, 19, in 2001, 
there is a white academic at Vets University named Daryl Glazer. So he publishes a book titled Politics and Society in South Africa. And I'm going to, you know, read to you one of the things that he says, you know, um, he says in the book. This is about white people. And he says, there is no precedent on the basis of which to assess their likely fate, which is the fate of white people. Post-1994 South Africa is the first black-run state to govern a large number of white people. I'm going to reread this so that it, it sinks. This is a white academic advert. Publishes a book in 2001, and he says about white people in South Africa post-1994, and I quote, there is no precedent on the basis of which to assess their likely fate. Post-1994 South Africa is the first black-run state to govern a large number of whites. Why does he have to say this? Why does he have to say there is no precedent on the basis of which to judge how white people will fare in South Africa under a black run state? Because he says South Africa post-1994 is the first black run state, you know, to govern a large number of whites. Now there is a displacement, there is an anxiety that the white subject experiences in South Africa in 1994. Because the history of thought had always said, you are always responsible for the black person. But suddenly the black person is now responsible for them. So the white subject is thrown into a disarray by 1994. It was the same thing at UCT 2015-2016 as a result of roads must fall and fees must fall. This white subject at UCT, whether it was the white student, whether it was the white professor, whether it was the white administrator, they had always thought of themselves as the source of authority at UCT, as the people who set the rules of the relations with black people. Suddenly, 2015, 2016, office must fall and roads must fall, displaces this white figure. And so from 2015, 2016, this figure is basically grouping. It's, it's in the wilderness, so to say. You know, it's, it's struggling to reconcile its reality with what Western thought has always said. That you are always superior to a black person. You are responsible for a black person. A black person can't be responsible for you. But then they find themselves where there's this ascendant black, you know, consciousness at UCT that says, no, now I'm responsible for you. We have seen that after four years of displacement from 2015, 2016, this white figure at UCT, there is now a resurgent white persona at UCT. They've seen that the momentum of 2015, 2016 has died down. So they are now reasserting themselves in line with what modern thought has always taught them. This is what you see in the country generally. Now, the agitations by white people, you know, um, about the problems of this country, you know, are nothing but an attempt to reassert the authority and the truth of this subject, which is that it's always superior. So you get a sense from all the noise that politici white political parties are making that this thing can only work, this country can only work if we are in the center. So there is an attempt to recenter this white subject. So you get a sense that, you know, the politics, for instance, of this Munshut uh, Pet. Basically, that's nothing but an attempt by this white consciousness, you know, to reassert, to put at the center, again, this white figure that has always said it can only work if we're leading. If we're not leading, it can't work. Now, at UCT, we see exactly the same thing. There is a reversal of the gains that, you know, we made as a result of FISMA's fall, you know. So, if you are looking for empirical evidence of this resurgent white figure, it is, you know, the way in which the university has mistreated 
or mishandled or vandalized the integrity of a black female vice chancellor called uh, former vice chancellor professor Pake. until today i do not think that the public has ever been told what was a crime it is the same thing you know with the black female chair of council you know miss ngonya exactly the same treatment you can see this white figure that it is now very bold again just as it was prior to Fisma's fall, that it's going to sweep aside everything black and reassert itself at the center. Now, look at the absurdity of it all. At UCT, when a black female chair of council is removed, for whatever reason, Miss Ngonya, and the black female deputy chair is removed, guess who gets elected? Mm. Two males. In 2023, you have a council at UCT that finds nothing wrong with removing two black female South Africans and replacing them with two males, colored males. This is at the height of a society that is battling the problem of patriarchy. But you have a council that finds nothing wrong, you know, with that. But this is indicative of this resurgent white persona. Now, so that we do not confuse, you know, the audience, it doesn't matter that it might be other identities. Indeed, it is two-colored males that, you know, are at the center here. But ultimately, the project that is being served is the project of white supremacy. That it at present presents itself in the other identities should not hide the fact that the larger identity that is reasserting itself is the white identity. So this is the situation that UCT finds itself in at present. It may then as a result be possible to say that the university is perhaps in an even worse situation than it was, mm. you know, by 2016. This is the reason why it's worse. It is because you have an actively, actively involved, or rather you have an active white supremacist spirit mm. or persona at UCT. Now the problem, is that you have in 2023 in South Africa a possibility of a white supremacist persona, you know, that is able to assert itself unashamedly. That is what makes the situation even grave. Because people are going to say, but aren't there black people who are employed? What is a problem is that in a recently decolonized country, you have precisely a, colo a white colonial spirit that is now making itself the order of the day. I think that's what is worrying about the situation at UCT. But it's not just at UCT, it's in the country generally. You get a sense in the country generally that white people no longer want to be governed by black people. So they want to reassert again the truth of the white subject or the authority of the white subject to exemplify. You see, when the Western Cape is making all the noise about they want more police powers, they want all of that, it is not in the name of good governance. No one should be misled. It is not a desire for good governance, or it is not a desire for a better run society. If indeed they wanted a just society where there is no crime, at least we would have seen with how they treat black people in the locations in Cape Town. Mm. That's where they should have said, look at how we try to create a more humane society in Cape Town. But the condition of black people, whether it's in Kaelicha, in Maspumele, in Gualanga, you know, everywhere else, is the worst, it is the worst condition that black people find themselves in. So the, the, the clamor, that you see in the Western Cape and by the DA, you know, for more powers, you know, for the province. It's not about good governance. It's not about a better society. It is precisely this white persona reasserting itself and saying that we don't want to be governed. Or it says modern thought since the 16th century has always said as white people we should be the ones responsible for black people you can't have black people running it rough shot over us so look at the personal look at the behavior of a young person like the mayor of Cater. 
read the tone with which he speaks to the president of the country, a black president of the country, there is no sense of respect whatsoever because it is this white consciousness, you know, that is reasserting itself. The other realm where this persona is reasserting itself, you know, you find these days, you know, white organizations, whether it's Afro Forum, whether it's the Helen Sussman Foundation, Freedom Under Law, whatever, you know, or um, these white organizations, always quick to get off these kids to go and argue in court about the irrationality of decisions taken by a black government. Those arguments, the, the attempt to establish through a court of law the irrationality of actions taken by a predominantly black government have nothing to do with good governance. It has nothing to do with the fact that they are fighting corruption. No, nothing whatsoever. It is the white persona reasserting the truth of modernist thought, modernist thought that has always said rationality and reason are the preserve of a white person. Because you've never seen, you've never seen any of these organizations take the white government of the Western Cape, you know, to court on the basis of reason or rationality of their actions. It is because it's known as a black person always you must plead your rationality before a white person. Recently, President Tabumbegi made a statement that I, I thought, you know, um, I, I agreed with. He said that there is a systematic project to make sure that the Democratic Republic fails. I think that what he means in the point is the fact that this wide scale project to ensure that the democratically run black republic fails does not begin now, does not begin 10 years ago. It was always there in 1994 because there is a contradiction. The white consciousness can never subordinate itself to a black consciousness. Mm. And now the problem with a black run state is that you have a white consciousness that has to subject itself to a black consciousness. And so it cannot find peace with the reality of a black run democratic republic. And because there is this stalemate, this stalemate has been there since 1994. White people don't know how to be unto black people and black people don't know how to be unto white people. And as a result of this stalemate, these two consciousnesses refusing recognition to each other, the country has ground to a halt. It's going to eventually lead to failure. They are self, two self-serving arguments in it. You then say, this is the failure of the ANC. No. It is this failure is a logical outcome of these two consciousnesses locked at a stalemate. And so there is no movement forward. You have the white consciousness that is refusing recognition to the black consciousness, and you have a black consciousness that is clamoring for recognition. And so the country is unable to move forward. Now, the white consciousness of white people know that as long as the stalemate remains, the country can progress. Mm. Failure that we see today is a logical consequence of this stalemate. So that's why I'm saying President, former President Tawambeki was correct. What I think he didn't emphasize enough is that this systematic project to ensure that a black-run democratic republic fails was always already present by 1994 because South Africa, remember what Daryl Glazer says, South Africa post-1994 is the first black-run state to govern a large number of white people. And so this creates an anxiety for the white persona or the white consciousness. And so you have these two consciousnesses that are locked in a stalemate, there's no resolution. The white consciousness is refusing recognition to the black consciousness and the black consciousness is clamoring for recognition. And there's a stalemate, there's failure. And then you go from the moon shoot pact, which restores the white consciousness at the center. And then you take other black consciousnesses that are not yet conscious of themselves into this moon shoot pact. And then you say, you would see, if we take over, it's going to work. It is true, it's going to work. You know why? Because you would have restored the white consciousness mm -hmm. at the center. And then 
That stalemate would have been resolved, of course, if we allow the white consciousness to take over the country again in 2024. So the exclusion of the ANC from that moonshot pact is a self-serving argument. It is not because it is corrupt. No, it is because the failure, the narrative of the failure of the ANC validates modern thought that says they are not capable. They always have to be our responsibility. That's why we came to colonize them. So you think that's the reason why John Stan Hazen would make a statement like EFF is enemy number one in these 2024 upcoming elections? You know why it's enemy number one? It is because the EFF represents a very resurgent or a very strong assertive black consciousness. And so it, these two consciousnesses can't coexist. The white consciousness and the EFF, you know, represent two contradictory consciousnesses. What they don't realize is actually the fact that the EFF represents a possibility of a contradiction with these two consciousnesses that might lead to something, that might lead to progress. We don't know what the outcome would be, but for as long as that contradiction is not resolved, you know, it does not get us an outcome, the country is not going to move forward. Because the attempt to restore the white consciousness at the center, you would see investment are going, investments are going to start flowing. All the capital that is locked in that today is on a strike, it's going to open up. But then the black consciousness is going to reassert itself. We're going to start all over again. So the point I'm making in all of this is that you have a problem of a resurgent white persona in South Africa that wants to reassert the superiority of the white consciousness or the white person. And you see that in the country and you see that, you know, at UCT, it's the same thing. What would become of this country and what would become of UCT is how black people respond to this resurgent white persona. And UCT, I can see, because I'm quite involved with that process, I can see the black consciousness also asserting itself. So we may be heading for another, you know, FISMAS fall at UCT mm. or a reenactment of FISMAS fall because black people, I, I get a sense at UCT, are not ready to allow this white consciousness reassert itself over them. So they are not ready to assert, to allow a white, you know, domination by the white settler minority, you know, over them. And as they respond, there's going to be another clash and it's going to lead to another, you know, a reenactment of this must fall. I do not know how the country is going to respond to this, but I, I see a very dangerous trend in the country where you have this research and white persona, you know, um, such that now it is possible basically for people to be brazenly racist, white people to be brazenly racist, because they have seen that the black consciousness is not strong enough, you know, um, and so they are able to set, you know, uh, to remove that anxiety that Darrell Glazer, you know, was referring to when he says, there's no precedent on the basis of which to assess how white people will be treated. And so now that they've seen that the black consciousness is posing no threat to them, they are reasserting. What is the solution? Um, I think that the black consciousness or black people have to make white people realize that their survival, white people's survival, is dependent on the survival of black people also. I think white people have a sense that they can survive on their own. The white consciousness thinks that it doesn't need the black consciousness to survive. And so when in practical terms, White people think that you can run to the private sector for everything. They, 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 they think that as the post office grinds to a halt, you open career companies. Uh, as, as, as the police fail, you can, you know, um, resort to private security companies. As everything else fails, you can tend to the white private sector. The white private sector basically today presents itself as the messiah. So everything goes wrong here. You say, no, the private sector is ready to help. Basically, we know in South Africa, the private sector is a metaphor for white people. Mm. So white people say they are ready to help. But the failure is precisely as a result of their refusal. 
you know, to extend recognition to the black consciousness. So it's a self-serving failure. They created the failure deliberately so that they can reassert their authority. So it's like basically a doctor who watches you fall ill, you know, in fact, who helps you fall ill and then comes to say, but I can help you. When in actual fact, he or she helped you, you know, to fall into sickness. And then when you seek, says, but now I can save you. If you come to me in my own terms, I can save you. That is what is happening in South Africa. So, so is that the reason why our parastatals are being privatized? So first let's start, how do the parastatals get to the point where they, they are in? And you know, I think that President Mbeki also made the point. He says, yes, greed. Yes, there is corruption, but he says that's not the reason why these these parastatals, you know, have you know collapsed. So state institutions have collapsed. Now let me try and point you to something else that is the reason for 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 the collapse of these institutions. There are three of us in this room. We are black. We're in a university. I teach in the university. Ask me how many black professors of electrical engineering do I know? How many? I don't, not a single short black South African professor of electrical engineering. I don't know any. How are you going to run ESCOM successfully? How many black oncologists do you know? I mean, oncologists, uh, specialist doctors do you know? Or how many black surgeons you know, do you know? How are you going to run an efficient health system then? First, the white consciousness knows fully well what is needed to run a modern state. But by refusing that recognition ensures that that capability is not available to the black consciousness or to the white, to the black run democratic republic. Now this is not, this is not sabotage you go to look for and you see someone saying, me, I'm going to sabotage. Go to the University of Cape Town and ask, since 1994, how many black professors of electrical engineering have you trained? Mm. Now, now, how were you hoping that a black run state is going to succeed? You have a nuclear power station in Cape Town, Kubek. So you need nuclear physicists to run it. How many black nuclear physicists do I know? I don't know a single, or maybe I know one at first. You know, um, only one. In a country where we are 82% of the population. Now, go ahead and ask, where is the concentration of capital in the country that is available for investment? All of the capital that is available for investment in South Africa today is in the hands of white people. So how are you going to have an efficiently run, you know, black democratic republic? If by 1994, the white subjects or the white settler colonizers in South Africa didn't have these anxieties about being run by a black you know, state or being ruled by a black state. If they had recognized, as I say, that our survival as this white consciousness is dependent on recognizing the black consciousness, they would long have said, together let us you know, uh, produce the necessary skill that is required, you know, in order to run a country efficiently. But what did they do? They withdrew their skill. Mm. Not only did they withdraw their skill from ESCOM, from Transnet, from everywhere, they then blocked the production of that skill, you know, in the universities. Because remember, the universities are still run by them. They blocked the production and then they wait for failure. They knew that that failure is eventually going to come. Because you don't have your own expertise as black people to run a modern state. And so they waited and then the moment came, you know, and now the private sector, you know, is saying we can help. Why is this private sector able to help? If there is a shortage of skill in the country, so it means the private sector had the skill. So why was this skill not available? Suddenly, when you want to fix logistics and rail, suddenly there is skill in the private sector that is now available to help. Why was this same skill not available to produce en mass black skill that is going to... So it always wants to be benevolent. You know, it always must come in its own terms 
we've come to salvage you because there's no recognition that our survival is dependent on your survival. So let's do this together. No, it can't be. It has to be one consciousness, which is the white consciousness that is responsible for this one, this childlike, you know, we had always known they can't run modern systems. They would always have to depend on us. That's what modern thought had always said. So the point is that the parastatals, to answer you, and the state institutions get to the point where they are. As a result of this stalemate, you know, that I've identified between the white consciousness and the bare consciousness. And now that, you know, they've ground to a halt, what does that do? It validates the superiority of the white consciousness. Now it comes back and say, well, we can resuscitate this country if you just let us, you know, help you and put us at the center of it. We will resuscitate it because the white consciousness always is the source of reason and rationality. It's the source of authority. It's the source of knowledge. You know, it's, it's synonymous with skin. It's synonymous with everything else. I mean, the only absurdity in it all is that, you know, you also have a black, you know, president, you know, who every turn says we must import skin. You have 82% of the population here. And, you know, what kind of skill you can produce in 29 years? But because that stalemate was never appropriately diagnosed by the nationalist elite, this is where I think also Tabo, you know, didn't quite, you know, tell us the full truth. He must then have said that, you know, there's always been this systematic project to make sure that a black run democratic republic fails. But what we failed as the nationalist elite was to diagnose properly this, you know, systematic project and then answer the question, what is to be done with this systematic project? What would have had to be done? It would have had to be a confrontation, a direct confrontation between the white consciousness and the black consciousness, and the resolution would have had to be found in order to affect this systematic failure that he's talking about. September and the significance of this month for black people. In black cosmology, um, this is the start. In Zulu cosmology, this is the start of a new year. Um, in, um, in, in political life of black people, uh, this is the month we lost uh, Bantu Biko, you know, to, to, to white brutality. Um, you know, um, so we remember precisely one moment when we had correctly diagnosed that statement between the white consciousness and the black consciousness because part of what Vigo had basically done was to appropriately diagnose this statement, you know, between the white consciousness and the black consciousness because his point was that the response to white settler colonialism can be black, you know, um, a black response. In part because he recognized correctly, and the ideology of black consciousness recognized correctly, that the reason for colonialism was not simply economic. The reason for our colonial domination was indeed economic, but it was more than that. The reason for our domination was because the white subject or this white Western European man had given unto himself, and it was a gender, you know, white European man at the time, had given unto himself godlike authority, said, because I am possessed of reason, the whole world is available for my naming, you know, and categorization. So this is why Europe sits and draws the map of the world and names every country, you know, in the world, because they had now, since the modern period, given unto themselves this godlike authority of taking responsibility for the world. So colonialism is not just explicitly an economic project. It is part of establishing the superiority of the white, you know, consciousness. And so Bigo says that the problem with thinking about colonialism as having been motivated to the last instance by the desire for profit is that we are going to misdiagnose 
the nature of this contradiction. And I think this is where we are. And so September is very significant because, you know, this is the month that um, we lost Biko, who, to add, you know, had actually given us an important lesson, which was that the problem is that if you do not attend to the nature of the black consciousness, you are going to lead people to freedom who are not ready for freedom. If you think of freedom in a limited sense of a vote, you are going to lead people into freedom who are not ready to be free, who do not have a desire to be free. Look at black people around white people. Do you get a sense that these are people who want to be free? Or you get a sense that these are people who want to be free at the pleasure of white people? Or put differently, do you get a sense that when white people thwart black people's desire for freedom, are these black people ready to assert their freedom against this white persona that is thwarting their freedom? No. They would rather hold back on asserting their freedom in the face of a white persona. So you have people who actually are not free, who think they are free, but their desire for freedom falls short when it is confronted with a white personality or with a white ethic that denies that freedom to them. It was Bigo's point that if you take people to freedom who are not ready for freedom, you are going to have a problem because they are not going to fight in defense of their freedom. I suspect that the reason why this white persona in South Africa is again on the rise it is because you have black people who think freedom means voting, who do not think that freedom means a total way of self-actualization such that anything that stands in the way of your self-actualization is an enemy, not of you. It's not a basis, it's an enemy of your freedom. And so you must confront it as such. We then find names for it and then we wait for law. You say, no, the police must come. So you wait for someone else to come and assert your freedom for you. You are denied freedom on the spot and then you transfer the responsibility for securing your freedom, you know, to other institutions or to law or to police, you know. And I think that Bigo's, you know, example is that if white people want to oppress you, they must not do it at their own condition. So his point was that if they slap you, you must slap them back because it must not be at their pleasure or they must not oppress you in their own terms. You must resist it. The, the resistance must be immediate so that you create a contradiction because if they slap you and you go and open a case and a court case goes on for years, the white identity has asserted its superiority. If you deny it on the spot, Actually, it gets injured because it was not able to get its own way. And so you basically denied it, you know, the prop that it was looking for. So that was Bigo's, you know, lesson. And um, that was, you know, um, what September. Spiritual alignment for black people and nature, especially from this month of September. I know it's a deep topic, <laughs> but uh, maybe just with the cover cover my mouth. No, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a subject that is pretty close to my heart. Um, I, in, in, in anyone, who, uh, anyone who's heard me talk, you know, some other time would have known that I, I am very passionate about our modes of being in the world as black people. I'm also very passionate about, you know, um, what, is, what is, for a lack of a better term for now, uh, what is called uh, indigenous, you know, knowledge systems. Um, but you know, it would it would require us to first unpack, you know, what is what is this knowledge, you know, what what is what are these modes of being in the world that I'm talking about, and that would require, I think, you know, another 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 you know session on its own. I can briefly say something about you know the, the spiritual you know alignment. One of the things that is fairly evident in the lives of black people in South Africa today is the fact that 
Even when we are rich materially, our souls are famished as black people. Our spirits are poor as, as, as black people. Because there is an erroneous you know, assumption that has been fed to us that to be a complete human being, all you need is material possessions. Suddenly we have seen that material possessions do not make a complete human being, a self-actualized you know, human being. And so this is why it is actually mostly those who have accumulated more who complain about you know, a disjuncture in their spiritual world, in their emotional world, whatever name they give to it. Because one of the most obvious things is that money has its own ethic. So often people say, no, I need a lot of money, uh, but you know, I'm not going to change my behavior. I'm not going to stop being human because you know, I'm not going to lose my values because of money. I just need money and maybe I'll use money to do good. This is what they forget. You see, money has its own ethic. Money is not foolish to be specific. When you have it, just as you want to use it, it also says to you, I'm here, use me. And use me in a certain way. And so money comes with its own ethic. It promotes certain values, the value of consumption. Uh, you know, uh, Amantosa has, has a nice way of putting it, you know, uh, money in the pocket is useless. You know, it wants to show itself. You have to show itself you know, in how you consume, how you dress, how you do all of those things. So money has its own ethic. Now, the problem is that you can't hope to have African values in a philosophical order or in a moral order that is not your own. So what Tina we are being called upon to do, why people set the moral order for our being in the world and then they say we must struggle here within this moral order for our own you know values for our own spiritual alignment it's impossible we must go to the center we must go to the core of the problem who designed this moral order that we live under and what is this moral order how aligned is this moral order with our own you know spiritual forms of being in the world and for as long as you leave that moral order, you may find yourself with all the good intentions, you know, under this umbrella, under this philosophical umbrella, you may struggle all you wish, you know, for these values, you would never succeed. Give you an example. So today, in fact, for as long as we've had a democratic government in South Africa, Every minister comes and tells us, minister of health comes and tells us about the importance of integrating, you know, traditional medicine into nothing has come out of it. You see, because Western medicine, which is the philosophical umbrella, has no room for this. You can only talk about it and say it's important, you know, uh, the state recognizes it and all of that. But there are no institutions that give it expression because the philosophical order, the, mor the modern moral order, you know, is not our own. And so there are attempts by different, you know, uh, people or sections of, you know, black society to reenact our own spiritual forms of existence, our modes of existence. But we find it difficulty because we operate you know, in a modernist moral order that is not our own, whose values are antithetical, you know. So this is why we're a people whose souls are not at rest. This is why we're a people whose souls are wandering all over. You know as well as I do that if I die of an accident, you know, a road accident, my spirit has to be collected from wherever I die. And, you know, it has to be reposed with my body, you know, wherever the internment takes place. But somehow, because we have a moral order held by the Christian values that has demonized that, you have wandering spirits of our people mm. that are not at rest and that cause all the problems, you know, we see. But these problems, by the way, are not that you see other repeated accidents. It is that because the souls of my own folk, my brother, my mother, whoever it is, is not at rest. I also can't be at rest. 
And so it doesn't matter how much I chase the material possessions, but because, you know, the spirits of those who came before me and the spirits of those who are supposed to guide me are not at rest. So you have this disquiet that you have in society, and then we call it a problem of crime. You know, when you have, you know, children or you have young people who, you know, customarily or maybe not customarily, who, you know, um, whose, whose spiritual lives have not been attended to. And so what we see here is a problem of crime. It's a problem of drug abuse and whatnot. And we say it's a problem of crime. Whereas in a black society, where we are 82% of the society, when are we going to open the conversation so that it becomes an open conversation, not, you know, in hushed corners uh, as to a human being, to be a full human being has to be attended to or has to have their material needs attended to, but also they have to have their spiritual world aligned so that there is an equilibrium between your spiritual world and your material world or your physical world. For as long as there is no equilibrium, I can take you to the best schools, you are not going to be able to make it. All of a sudden, I'm going to talk about kinds or other kinds of problems you have because there is a disequilibrium. Disease for us as black people is not something that just visits us. Disease is a sign of a disequilibrium between your ancestral world or your spiritual world and, you know, the physical world. When are we going to get to a point where people don't go repeatedly to the hospital for diseases that cannot be cured with Western medicine? When in actual fact it is their spirits that are troubled that need to be attended to. Now this is South Africa, where 82% of the population. When you go to China, there is Chinese medicine. It's not something that is spoken about. It's not, it's not, you know, a down. The state recognizes that this is a way of being in the world. You come to South Africa where 82% of the population, Western biomedicine is our only notion of health. When are we going to attend to the cultural health and to the spiritual health of our people? Dr. Rosilo Shabo. <laughs> I think this was short, man. I think what, like an hour, an hour and a half? I would really, really be honored for our next visit. So we'll buy in September, maybe before the end of the year or maybe beginning of next year. By all means, I would be more than, I would be more than privileged. And on behalf of all the hustlers and all of our audiences out there, we appreciate your time. Thank you. It is you that we have to thank. It is you that we have to thank. It is uh, black people that we have to thank. Um, for remaining resilient despite living under very difficult conditions of a settler colonial society. Thank you very much. Let's wrap it up. Last words to the people out there. No, I, I, I think that um, as, as black people, we must dare to envision a different world. I think the Western model of modernity has held us for, a few, for too long. We must not fear what difficulties we are going to encounter. Because I think that the leech that hold us back, people fear. So if we jettison this modern world, what are we going to get into? We must not have a fear. Before a child walks, a child is on you know, his or her knees. Eventually, we will also figure it out. Europe did not know in the 16th century that it will be like this today. Why are we being asked as black people, you know, to answer that question also? We know we don't like where we are. So let us not fear, you know, um, let us not, let us liberate our imaginative capabilities. We can imagine a different world, but the starting point is not to have fear that jettisoning the Western modern order will mean the end of the world. It certainly will not. So was I'm cool. Thank you very much. I hope you guys enjoyed the session. We'll see you on the next video.